Time to start getting the wheels onto the frame with the first wheel mount, the bottom wheel mount. Now I've got two problems with this. First of all, unlike Canada, we don't have maple forests growing at the bottom of the garden. So hardwood here in the UK is a little bit more difficult to get hold of. Now, as Matthias says, you could probably get away with a good hard softwood like Scott's pine, but uh, I wanted to uh, try and use a strong mount block here because I've probably got to do the wheels again. The plywood is so awful. I don't want to end up having to do this again if the shaft moves too much. Now, I have got some small pieces of hardwood, so that brings to mind the second problem with this arrangement here. It's easy enough to get this orientation uh, perpendicular to the frame, but it's more difficult to get this orientation perpendicular to the frame. And the tension on the blade is pulling this way. So if you were looking at this end, you've got a clockwise rotational force on this block like that. So when you attach this to the frame, the likelihood is that you're going to have to make a little bit of adjustment up and down. And I want to avoid using a partial shim anywhere because that reduces the contact area and that reduces the coupling between the shaft block and the frame. And a lot of the point of having such a sturdy, stiff frame is to take the tension from the blade, about £300 in total. So how can I adjust the up-down angle of the shaft here without using shims? Well, the idea I've come up with, I christen a Battenberg wheel mount, which won't make any sense unless you're a fan of cakes and you live in Britain. Americans have a cake like it, North Americans, but they call it a checkerboard cake and that's not nearly as exotic a name as a Battenberg block. The idea is that I'll drill the shaft hole through here between these blocks and these blocks. Now with an end load on the shaft it's going to twist. That means it'll be bearing up into this quadrant and it'll be bearing down into that quadrant. So if I arrange hardwood here and hardwood here, I should take care of that load better. And for micro adjustments, it also gives me the possibility to do differential squishing, if you like. If I tighten up the uh, attachment bolts down here, then it's not going to have much effect because it'll be pushing the shaft into the hard wood. But that's not usually the problem. The problem is usually canting the shaft down that way against the tension in the blades. And if I tighten up the attachment bolts on the other side, then I'll be squishing, not so much into this hard wood here, but I'll be squishing the shaft into the underside of this softwood here and be able to make a tiny adjustment to the up-down axis downward. For grosser adjustments, before I get to that point, I'll do some shaving of the blocks. Well, no, not down there, up here. Now, I don't want the Forstner bit to get confused by having hardwood and softwood in one cut. So I'm going to make the actual shaft hole cuts like that. And I've got a 22mm Forstner bit, but as we mentioned in a previous video, the shaft is just a tad under 22mm. So what I'm going to do is shim here. I thought about these plastic packer shims, but they might slip a little bit. They're quite slippery. So this is about a millimeter, a double-sided piece of sandpaper. I'll put some double-sided tape in here to hold it together. And I'll put a shim there and another one here. And then when I drill the 22 millimeter hole through here and remove the shims, it's going to grab the shaft. That's the plan. I also forgot to mention the other advantage that uh, you can get all the way through on one standard force a bit with this approach. So, a bit slack, take the shims out, fingers crossed, yeah, good. With the top wheel mount, the thing you have to be careful of is that the plans are based upon Matthias's laminate thickness, which was 16mm. If you've used thicker laminate, and I certainly have, these are 20mm, then this distance here is greater. The plans call for two laminations without spines 
and then three laminations with spines and that means that gap there is bigger in mine than the plans assume. So I have to make the sliders and the frame and the block for that matter to take this 20 millimeter into account. I'm just setting up the copy ring on the plunge router. If you'd like more information on copy rings there's an earlier video. And I've laid out a template for the inside of one slice of the upper wheel mount frame. You could make the frame out of individual hardwood pieces and finger joint or spline the corners but uh, if you've got some nice plywood and I have got some Baltic birch that's spare then of course that's already splined if you can cut a nice neat middle out of it. Uh, if you've got a good jigsaw technique or you want to use a scroll saw I suppose uh, you could just cut the hole out there but uh, I'm going to route it out. Five, excellent. By eighty-five, cool. So I have to make the L brackets and the frame correspondingly thicker. The other thing to bear in mind is you might want to look at yet the latest Matthias Bansor, an 18 inch, where he considers that there's a lot of stress on this and that you might make the front spine member hardwood. And the wheel mount block itself will need to have a thicker projection here and a face that comes out to be parallel with the face of the frame. The face of the lower wheel mount block is coplanar with the face of the frame and you want the same thing for the upper wheel mount block. You don't want a big overhang on the shaft because that increases the leverage on it. Here's the upper wheel mount block and you'll see once again it's uh, laminated because the cost of buying a single piece of hardwood of that profile, probably only available in a minimum length of a meter, here in the centre of London would be prohibitive. So inch thick sapili is readily available and not too expensive and very hard. It's harder than hard maple, it's harder than white oak and it's way harder than the mahogany it resembles. So sapili it is. The other advantage of laminating it is that if you do the drilling in stages, the forstner bit has no problem reaching all the way through. The essential shape of this is a sort of a two-tooth ratchet. It's this part here. This lip here hooks into here. This is the sliding frame and a tension will pull that up the T-bars at the sides of the spines at the top. Now, for some reason, it is suggested by the good Matthias, and I'm sure he's right, that you also want to be able to tilt this. The lower wheel mount block doesn't tilt other than your first adjustments to get the whole thing true. But this one will tilt. This bit here, having hooked around here, this top bit here, because the force will be clockwise if the shaft is uh, out here, that bit there will be pulled onto this face here, except there'll be a bolt through there impinging on a plate in here, and by adjusting that bolt we will tilt the whole upper wheel mount backward and hopefully get not just a correctly tensioned blade, but a nicely lined up wheel. That's the upper wheel mount block done then. You've got your lip at the front there, which fits over the lip in the frame. The frame goes up and down on this bolt here to give tension and this bolt goes in and out against this plate here to adjust the tilt. The plans make a gap here and that's so that you can shim it as you're adjusting it. There's various possibilities for shimming that. I thought it might be a big enough gap to get some of my spare Teflon sheet in from another project but uh, the sheet is too thick. If you've got some ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene tape, 
uh, you could use that. But thick tape is really expensive and I don't have any. If you had a thinner gap you might get away with the thin tape, which is a bit uh, cheaper. The uh, most likely possibility A is a sheet, a strip of uh, hardwood. That's just about the right size, although a little slack. And most likely possibility B is some brass shim. There's enough room in there to get a couple of pieces of brass in. Now, why would you do that? Well, brass has an interesting property. It's self-lubricating. The oxides of brass are slippery and they're not produced too rapidly. In other words, it doesn't corrode too fast. The oxides of iron are useless, except as half of a uh, thermite mixture. And the oxides of aluminium are absolutely essential. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, bare aluminium. As soon as it's exposed to the air, an oxide layer forms, and it's an incredibly tough, shrinking oxide layer, which is why aluminium is so stable. Uh, the other name, of course, by which we know aluminium oxide is emerald and ruby. Very, very tough stuff. But I'm not sure about uh, its self-lubricating properties, although it does seem quite slippy. Anyway, the stuff of the right size is brass, so I may stick a piece of brass on each of those bits of wood and have them slide past each other. We shall see. The other thing I have to do is make a tension crank for here and fit a knob on there.